Welcome to the Endless Knot Podcast. Where the more we know, the more we want to find out. Tracing serendipitous connections through our lives and across disciplines. Hi, I'm Avon. And I'm Mark. And today we're going to be talking about the recent movie by Guy Ritchie called King Arthur, The Legend of the Sword. Because we kind of have to. It's a King Arthur movie. <laughs> <laughs> and for once, we actually got to get out of the house and see something in yeah. the theater. It so was very exciting. We're finally topical with a movie. <laughs> I mean, a week or two behind. But hey, there you go. a month maybe. But that's really close to topical for yeah. us. <laughs> So related to this, by the way, before we get into it, if you're interested in the historical period that surrounds the original Arthur story, you can have a look at our couple of latest videos that deal with, in part, the uh, historical circumstances of the 5th and 6th century in Britain, and in particular, the collaboration that we did with Jabzy. So we'll put a, a link to this in the show notes, but it's about the foundations, the legendary or historical legendary slash historical foundations of Anglo-Saxon England, a big part of which is the famous Battle of Mount Baden, which eventually becomes connected with the King Arthur story, but not in this film. <laughs> and also which features Vortigern. And features Vortigern in particular, yeah, who is the bad guy of the latest Arthur adaptation. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so we'll put a link to that. And then related to that, just if you're interested, we also have a video on what is the earliest English word that we have still recorded to this day. Indeed. So we'll links to both of those in the show notes if you're interested. Now, before we get going, we're going to have a drink. <laughs> we spent quite a long time trying to figure out what cocktail would go best with this. And it turns out that the entire field of Arthurian romance is very underserved in the cocktail naming industry. To be fair, there are a few, but the few that they that exist all contain things we don't have difficult ingredients. Yeah. But there weren't very many. No, like not I thought, a huge there'd be number. a lot more. Yeah. Hmm. So bartenders, if you're out there, get on that. There's an entire world of Arthurian romance. Lots of names, good things. Sort of the stone cocktail, round table cocktail. Like work on it. In the meantime, we've won for the obvious a King Arthur cocktail. Except that we didn't have some of what was in the King Arthur cocktail. To be fair, this one called for not oh. two unusual ingredients, but we just happened not to have one basic component. So we decided to go with the basic outlines of the King Arthur cocktail, but randomly substituting things for what was called for in the original recipe in somewhat with a certain devil may care attitude. <laughs> and we thought that that was actually a pretty appropriate way to match to this movie. So the King Arthur cocktail originally had vodka, grenadine, orange juice, and, and cranberry, cranberry juice. juice. The drink you're about to try has vodka, apple and pear vodka, grenadine, cranberry bitters, quite a lot of them, and orange bitters. Okay. So no juice. No juice at all. All right. Have a sip. <laughs> it's very, very red. Yeah, I'm sure it tastes sort of sweet and bitter. <laughs> yeah, sweet and bitter. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's great. <laughs> it's not, not a lot though. of subtlety, but it's fine. That pear and apple vodka is actually really quite nice. Yeah. So, yeah, okay, that's not so bad. I thought it might be horrible. It's just sort of adequate. Oh, it is. does have quite the bitter aftertaste, though. I put a lot of bitters in. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so we're going to turn to the Guy Ritchie movie. Now, if you haven't seen it, there will be spoilers. I don't think it's the kind of movie that spoilers are a big deal for, but maybe. There's certainly stuff in there you wouldn't know going in, even if you know the story of King Arthur really well. So mm -hmm. be warned. If you're interested in seeing the movie and you don't want to hear details about it, maybe wait until after you've seen it to listen to this. It's directed by Guy Ritchie and produced by Guy Ritchie, along with a team of other producers. Guy Ritchie also contributed to the screenplay along with a couple of other writers. It stars Charlie Hunnam, Astrid berger Frisbe. I don't know how her name is pronounced. She is not an actor I know. Jimon Hunsu, Aidan Gillen, Jude Law, and Eric Bana. And I think that's pretty much enough setup. Maybe a bare outline of what the plot is, just to situate us. So it tells the beginning of Arthur's story mm -hmm. with, I suppose, room for later films. Um, so it deals with Arthur's early years and rise to power, being dispossessed of his, his inheritance. Mm -hmm. He grows up in obscurity in a brothel and only finds out that he is the sort of 
prophesied heir to the throne, when he draws the famous sword out of the stone, he has to, of course, take his kingdom from an evil villain, mm -hmm. Vortigern, and he does so with the help of a ragtag bunch of friends and some of whom are also from his sort of dissolute beginnings. And they eventually uh, win the day. And Arthur becomes King Arthur by the just right at the very end of the film. That did a spectacularly poor job of explaining anything that's unique about that movie. <laughs> well, yes, I, I figure we may want all of the things that situate it as a different as, plot. As a different plot, <laughs> yes. I was trying to uh, <laughs> trying to leave the the sort of discussion points. Well, let me just draw a few points. I mean, everything you said is correct. It is set in a world which has magic. It has a lot of magic. Yeah. It opens with a battle between Uther, Arthur's father, yeah. and a magical force. We'll get back to him. It then proceeds quickly to Uther being killed and Arthur being abandoned and then rescued. He grows up in an inner city way. I mean, it's London. It's set in a medieval setting, but one that is anachronistic in many different ways, yeah. in a bunch of you know forward and back kind of ways. Mm -hmm. And then in the progression to the Sword in the Stone, we have a lot of very magical stuff going on. And he's helped in particular by a magical uh, figure, a woman who is a mage. And there's a lot of spiritual, it's not really the right word, magical, magical. events yeah. and help and supernatural elements to the story and the final confrontations with his uncle. Yeah. So the usurper is Vertigran, is yes. Uther's brother. And the final confrontation involves Arthur killing him. All right. So that's the basics of it. What was your first reaction? Start with whether you liked it or not. How did you feel about it as a movie? Um, there was the occasional good element to its production. Mm -hmm. But overall, I would have to say it's a bit of a mess as a film. Just even leaving aside the Arthurian, as an Arthurian, as an Arthurian yeah. movie, and if, if we just took it as, you know, knowing nothing about King Arthur mm -hmm. and just taking it as a film, as I say, there are some good directorial elements to it, but it is kind of a mess of a film. I kind of enjoyed it. It's it's fun as a sort of popcorn film. If you don't think about it too hard, mm -hmm. there is a basic, there's good action stuff to it. And there's some snappy dialogue. Yeah. So the, as I say, there are some good elements to it. Mm -hmm. But it just, for me, it didn't hold together very well. Yeah, I'm trying to, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm just trying to, mm -hmm. to pin down my reaction to it. Action sequences in general don't hold my attention. They right. bore me. There's quite a lot of that in this mm -hmm. movie. I think they're well done, but they're just they're just not what grabbed me. So that doesn't make or break it. But I also recognize that they're a part of a, every movie. I don't mm -hmm. hold them against a movie. I thought there was enough sort of amusing dialogue mm -hmm. and snappy repartee to amuse me. Mm -hmm. Not mm -hmm. as much as in some of other Guy Ritchie movies, yeah. the Sherlock Holmes in particular, yeah. for instance, and not as much as I might have liked. There was a lot of tonal shifts that were jarring, but I think they were intentionally jarring. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Um, I was not necessarily thrown by that. I quite liked the movie style, which is in Sherlock Holmes yep. as well, of the sort of, um, what do you call them, recreations or something? Like when somebody's telling you a story, yes, you get yep. it uh, filmed for you, even at, and sometimes what really happened, sometimes what didn't happen, sometimes what might happen, yep. uh, recreated for you. I like that. I think yep. it works really well. And I thought it worked well in this movie in particular. Yep. There was a sort of a focalization going on of whose story was mm -hmm. being told. As I said, there were some yeah. nice directorial mm -hmm. touches to it. Well, I felt those were more than touches. I felt those were the sort of point of the movie. Yeah. In yeah. A, I mean, those weren't just the frills. They were mm -hmm. kind of the meat of the movie in a way. I almost felt like some of the action sequences and some of the other stuff were the frills. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that The plot mm -hmm. was almost mm -hmm. the frill because it wasn't really mm -hmm. the core of the movie. Uh, I certainly don't rank it as like one of the top movies I've seen or no, anything like no, that. No. But I didn't, uh, I didn't dislike it myself. I think I probably just from what you just said, I think yeah. I liked it more than you did. Okay, but that isn't going to stop me from having lots to say yeah. <laughs> about it. I mean, I you know I thought Charlie Hunnam was a, excellent, a yeah, engaging portrayal of Arthur. I thought um, he was an engaging portrayal of a person. I'm not quite sure what I feel about him as Arthur. Well, I think there's room for that, for, for this. And I was in some ways kind of perhaps to, what it is, is that I was a little disappointed because I was kind of excited about the idea of a sort of street brawling, rough and tough 
Arthur. Arthur. Right. And I thought that could be an interesting story to tell. Right. Not the chivalric. Yeah. 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 And I think that he portrayed that role quite well. I think mm-hmm. he brought that mm-hmm. to life. Mm-hmm. So my problem, my problems with the film aren't really so much with that, but with the structure, the overall structure right. of, of the film and what it was trying to do. Right. The bigger picture. Right. And, you know, I have to say, I really quite like um, Guy Ritchie's uh, take on Sherlock Holmes. Mm-hmm. And so I was kind of excited about the prospect of that kind of approach to the right. Arthur story. Right. 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 So for me, you know, the King Arthur stories are ripe for reinterpretation. Yeah. So I don't think they've we, always been reinterpreted. Yeah. So I think we should start by saying that I don't think either of us. I mean, I have gripes and I have moments Mm -hmm. and there are things I'd like to say just to get them off my chest. But overall, I don't think either of us is precious about the King Arthur story. No. I don't feel like there's only one version or you've got to get the right names in or as far as I'm concerned, you can put it in space if you want. Mm -hmm. Like you can do anything you want with the King Arthur story because from the very beginning, people were doing everything they wanted with it. Every yeah. version of King yeah. Arthur is mutually inconsistent and self-contradictory and, yeah. <laughs> you know, is, is a product of its own time and its own political considerations and its own social mores. Mm-hmm. So I'm not precious about the fact that this, you know, that this <laughs> has very little to do, do with, with the King Arthur story. Previous Arthur story. Yeah. yeah. That's not a knock on it. No. What I do think I'd like to talk about is in what ways it differs from other stories and what's accomplished by that well exactly what i was trying to as i was watching it it was i was trying to trying to kind of think okay what's the vision here what is Mm -hmm. what is he trying to accomplish with this film Mm -hmm. and i just felt it was just all over the place there were Mm -hmm. too many different things and they didn't all mesh very well Mm -hmm. I listened to an interview Guy Ritchie gave with Chris Hardwick on The Nerdist. Yeah. And so I, I'll come back to that because he talks about what he thought was the mm. core of the movie. I hadn't seen the movie yet, but, okay. um, you know, he talks about what he felt was this mm-hmm. sort of driving message or underlying sort of arc of Arthur yeah. in it. So I'll come to, back to that because... Well, it's just interesting to see what mm-hmm. he thought it was mm-hmm. by the time he produced it. Interestingly, he did say that they rewrote it very early on while they were like beginning to film oh. part of it anyway, or in some way they rewrote it. They had originally had a Guinevere love story in there. Okay. And they wrote it right out. In a sense, I mean, you don't need it nope. because it's one part of the Arthur story no, and, and it's not really a big part of the rise to power. Rise part. to power. No, absolutely. No. And I thought all I'm saying by bringing that up, I mean, I don't think he should have had a Guinevere. In fact, although it in some ways reduces the female component, but it doesn't really because there is a female component, but it's a very masculine film. I mean, it is Guy Ritchie movies film, are yes. all guy films. Of course they are. But in a way, I'm glad there wasn't yes. some token love interest yeah. thrown in. I mean, they did have a female character and she wasn't a love interest. There yeah. was a tiny hint of it, maybe, mm-hmm. but they never developed it. And I'm actually very happy about that. Yeah. I, I, in general, would like there to be fewer love interests in movies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So. I wish they'd done more with her because I think yeah. she was an interesting I wish they developed idea. her character and they'd yeah. given us more of her her perspective and more of her internal life. Mm-hmm. Uh, so this, the person we're talking about is the mage character yeah. who is the primary helper yeah. and in fact major component, mm-hmm. if you excuse the pun, <laughs> of his victory in the yeah. end. Yeah. And yet, and there is a backstory they, they sort given. Of hint at an interesting backstory mm-hmm. that her people were. Well, they um, give you a, a little bit about the idea that the mages were this group of wizards mm-hmm. or magical users who had lived in harmony with people of England for a while. And then over the course of the story, we're given the full sort of understanding that one of them had risen to prominence, helped by. Mm-hmm. Vortigern and they'd made a treacherous alliance and then as a result of that they had persecuted the rest of the mages and most of them had been killed first by the bad mage and then by Vortigern it's not made completely clear and so she's a member of a persecuted group yeah but they hint they tell us that but not very much and they it feels almost like they'd written more and then edited it out yeah you know that there was other backstory there about her emotional involvement with this like is she vengeful against Vortigern is she wounded? Does she have trauma behind her? What's going to happen to her now? Is she, uh, you know, mm-hmm. and yeah, and there's a lot of strength to her, but there's no, there's no character development given to her. No. 
there's not a lot of character development given to most of them. Yeah, except for Arthur, really. Yeah. So she's not exactly singled out for a flat character. Yeah. <laughs> but it would have been nice to mm-hmm. hear a little more about her. So maybe one bit that I just want to get out of the way. I said I'm not precious about Arthur. But can I just start with Mordred? Yes. <sighs> making Mordred of a previous generation is yeah. kind of odd. It was just so strange to choose... That name. They could have used any name, I suppose. I mean, I, I guess, guess they wanted one from Arthurian. Yeah. I thought it was kind of interesting that they used Vortigern. Yes. Oh, I don't have a problem with them using... I mean, I thought, yeah, I thought that was more motivated and yeah. understandable. I mean, Vortigern is an antagonist in the Arthurian mm-hmm. stories, even if he's in a different relationship. But mm-hmm. he's a semi-legendary, you know, whatever. Mm-hmm. Put him in... And it, and there is a story about him usurping yeah. and Uther having to come back. It's a different relationship. I mean, the story is that he ends up on the throne and Uther and his brother have to flee the country and then they come back, right? That's the story that Merlin's involved in, actually. Right. And they come back and they fight against him and he's killed. So there, he is a figure of that kind. So yes, they've shifted stuff around and generations around and yeah. relationships, but it's okay. It just the Mordred opening with the great mage Mordred was yeah. very, conf- it was just confusing yeah. because I genuinely didn't know who was fighting him. Yeah. And it was this man with Excalibur or with a sword so I thought it was maybe like, were we doing a flashback thing? Were we starting with starting Arthur? Starting with the end of the story and yeah. then it was going to do the rest of the, you know, fill in the backstory mm-hmm. and then. Which is, of course, a, a, a not unusual mm-hmm. opening. But no, it turned out to be Uther. I mean, was that intentional? Was it meant to be sort of cyclical in nature? Like you mm-hmm. start, but it didn't really end up paying that off. No. So I don't think it was. I think they just grabbed the name. Yeah. And Mordred is, you know, an antagonist again, mm-hmm. but it was odd. And Mordred is not a magical figure. Anyway, I said I wasn't going to be precious about Arthur. It just, it genuinely confused me. I've spent the first 10 minutes of the movie, quite apart from being confused by the setting Mm -hmm. and visuals, very confused as to what was going on. And had it just been a a mage with just a random name? Yeah, we would have been like, I would have been like, oh, okay, Mm -hmm. no, this is fine. Like, this is probably some sort of setup. Mm -hmm. Okay, I mean, I'm on board for a setup. But as it was, I was really thrown because Mordred is the one who kills Arthur, Arthur at the end yeah. or tries to, you know, wounds son. him mortally. Yeah, his bastard son. So it was just a strange thing to put in. So what did you think about the visuals and the, the sort of backdrop and the way the physical setting, like the way it was sort of set as in period or in mm. visuals? I mean, as as many Arthur films do, it has this kind of anachronistic, you know, on the one hand, it's got this kind of early medieval, theoretical early medieval setting anyways. Mm-hmm. With Vikings, for instance, we can come back to the Vikings. Well, the Vikings aren't really that early medieval. In, no, in but the they're sense, but earlier than, say, romance. Than romance, yeah. But, you know, the, the sort of armor and the, you know, the castles and so forth are... High medieval. High me- and, and in fact, the castles are basically... Totally impossible. impossible. They are nothing. They're, yeah. they're fantasy. Yeah, they look like high fantasy. So that's what I wanted to say. The opening also felt like high fantasy. Yeah. Straight out of like a video game or obviously Lord of the Rings. Lord of the Rings, yeah. The, it was those so... giant elephants are obviously... They seem uh, so Lord of the Rings. Bit, bit of a copy in, in yeah. a sense. You would, you would have thought, couldn't you come up with something new? Like camels, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> Rhinos. Yeah. Like, just make it something different. Mm-hmm. I know it's they were so... A bit of a cheat. They were so... I mean, they were bigger than the Lord of the Rings elephants, yeah. I guess. But yeah, and, and then that giant causeway... Mm-hmm. I suppose the Giant's Causeway. I don't know. I mean, this is the thing. I sort of feel like with a lot of stuff, there's hints of it maybe being an intentional call out to an actual Arthurian element. Yeah. Not the elephants. I don't know about that. No. But Causeway, that big bridge. Yeah. But Camelot is, is sort of... Um, did you get any sense of the geographical relationship of things? Because sometimes it took them days of traveling by horse and other times they seemed to take several hours yeah. to get between places. Mm-hmm. And why was the king in Camelot in what seemed to be just a random barren mountain when everyone apparently was in Londinium. The Roman city, I guess. Yeah, but that was clearly the economic center of the... Economic, the yeah, it was very odd. Center, yeah. Anyway, now, the idea of Camelot is kind of odd in that sense. Yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. what would be the point of a castle? It, it only works in a kind of fantasy, fantasy realm world. where there isn't an mm-hmm. economic center. Yeah. And I think that was maybe where I felt the biggest tonal disparity mm-hmm. was between the Camelot stuff and the Londinium, where because the Camelot stuff, it was high fantasy, yeah. like incredible buildings that mm-hmm. were just totally impossible. I mean, there's no period of the medieval or mm-hmm. modern time, basically, that has ever built like that. 
huge, unfeasible sizes and the tower and all the rest of it. And then we're in London and we're in... Very gritty. Yeah, and a, a, that kind of a realistic, reimagined medieval period, yeah. right? Where people are trying to sort of say, well, what would, what would it have really been like? You yeah. Know, dirty and gritty. Dirty and, and broken down and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And yet at the same time, on the wide shots of that city, it was huge. Yeah. It was really big. Yeah. Much big. bigger than London would have been. Ever. <laughs> yeah. Though it was interesting that they included elements of Roman ruins. Right. So again, I thought that was interesting because that felt like a very historicizing element. Yeah. So when you pull into Lo Londinium, you see, as they pull back, you see a, a ruined Colosseum. Yeah. A, well, amphitheater. It's not a Colosseum. But I mean, but it's clearly meant to look like the Colosseum for those people who aren't sure right. if we're Roman or not. No, no, this is going to be Roman. Roman. It's an Roman amphitheater. Yeah. And there's some old temples and stuff like that. And I thought that was kind of interesting because that places it in a, in a time mm -hmm. and in a historical timeline in a way that the high fantasy stuff in Camelot doesn't. Yeah. That could happen anywhere at any time. Well, and this is why I, I, I said I was trying to think of what, what the big picture here mm -hmm. is. And I found it a bit of a mess mm -hmm. because, you know, kind of comparing it to, to previous Arthur adaptations, sometimes they go with a very fantasy, mm -hmm. completely divorced from any historical period. Time of place. It could and be so anywhere, it's very anywhere. anachronistic, yeah. but that's fine because it, it comes across more as fantasy. Other times they try to very much locate it in actual history. Mm -hmm. So um, the, the sort of two films that I have in mind that kind of are those, are poles. The, those yeah. two poles, Excalibur, the 1981 John Borman film, is very much fantasy, mm -hmm. right? And it, it's very consciously a fantasy world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you There's know, Camelot is, is this it, yeah. gleaming kind of castle mm -hmm. that doesn't make a lot of historical sense, mm -hmm. but that's fine. And the, I and mean, the, the costumes. The costumes. The knights sit around feasting in their full armor, right? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's ludicrous, really. It's ludicrous, but, yeah. but it works. Be yeah. in, because it's, it's not trying to be realistic. It's, it's not trying, trying to tell to a realistic. fantasy story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Whereas the more recent King Arthur, 2004 King Arthur film, directed by Antoine Fuqua, produced by Jerry Bruckheimer, mm. that film made gestures, at least, towards. That's the one that began history. with. My Historians most, agree, yes. My, the one I cite as the most infamous opening yeah. screen. Historians agree that. And I always say to my students, historians anyone who tries to tell agree. you that historians agree is lying to you. Yes. <laughs> but it, it brings in some interesting yeah. little historical. It's trying. Kind of it elements. works with a few yeah. elements of archaeology, and it's trying. And it, it's trying to locate it mm -hmm. very specifically in a historical mm -hmm. place and time. And then it leaves it all aside up, but... all of the kind of fantasy magic and so forth. Yeah, it has only a tiny little bit of yeah. that. Yeah. Now, Guy Ritchie's film is sometimes doing one, sometimes doing yeah. the other, and they yeah. seem at odds. Yeah, no, I agree with that. And I was kind of, uh, you know, excited at the prospect of maybe having this gritty urban Arthur and sticking with that. That could mm -hmm. be kind of an interesting story to tell. And not necessarily a historicizing one either. Not a historicizing I, I thought it might one. be yeah. with going a modern in, aesthetic. And... Yeah, going in, I thought it might be like the Sherlock Holmes yeah. uh, and an anachronistic. Anachronistic, sure. So not historically mm -hmm. located and trying to you know tell us the real story behind it, the legend, mm -hmm. but one that was gritty and urban and medieval in some yeah. in some guise, but at the same time a product of gangs and yeah. modern aesthetic and modern sensibility. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's sort of what I thought it was going to be. And maybe rationalizing rather than necessarily historicizing, where they're trying to sort of find the yes. the psychological grit behind the story. Yeah, yeah. And that's kind of what I thought it was going to be. Who is Arthur as a person? Yeah, as a real, and why would he do? What are those motivations a, that are all dressed up? Not a legend, in, but as a real man. Yeah, what, what would, would the, he be like? Yeah, what would the, the motivations behind the chivalric, yeah. you know, talk mm -hmm. actually be, mm -hmm. good or bad? Mm-hmm. And that's and they were and there were definitely there parts were of that parts of that, but I think it was at odds with some of what mm -hmm. he did. It was like there was two movies, and one of them was the Vortigern centered one, yeah. that was really about magic and D and D stuff, yeah. And one of them was the Arthur one, and that was like that movie, like what we were just describing. And then at a certain point, they kind of overtook one another. Mm -hmm. I, I agree with you that that was odd. I didn't necessarily dislike it, but I also don't don't know how to reconcile them. And I feel like, you know, they were reaching for a mythology. They wanted to make it all mythic 
And mm -hmm. it just, you know, it was kind Missed. of overboard, mm -hmm. you know? It was, oh, we got to make it magical and mm -hmm. mythic. And so they're putting in giant elephants and... <laughs> Flaming men. And, yeah, yeah. You know, this magical tower, which again is kind of a, a ripoff of... Uh, uh, Lord of the Rings. Lord of well, the Rings and, and, and that really felt D&D-like. Yeah. I've got to say, like, the quest for his character was to build the highest tower. Yeah. And the quest for the other characters was to knock the tower yeah, down. Yeah. <laughs> you know? It's just, why? Why does he need a tall tower? There's no, we're never really given the rules of this magic. We're just told, no, that's what he needs. He needs a tower and he needs to finish it. And if he finishes it before we conquer him, he'll be all powerful. Mm -hmm. And why is he building the tower? Why does he want power? He's already king. Why is he so upset about that? No, we don't know. Mm -hmm. We just He's just evil and evil people want evil stuff. Why is he willing to murder his wife and murder his daughter for it? Mm, don't really know never actually given that character truth about it he maybe was didn't like that people liked his brother we given a little tiny flashback scene that maybe he was a bit jealous of his brother mm. so he thought he'd bring the whole country to smoking ruin when he could have in fact just murdered his brother and then just been king yeah yeah okay one of those you talked about mythic so one of the things that I thought about it was the Arthur story is already filled with all of those stuff, all of those elements that when we teach myth yeah. are what we teach, right? It's already the Campbell hero's mm -hmm. journey. There's the Jungian elements. I mean, the Arthurian legend is is brimming over with all of these things, the Rankian elements, all of it, because it, it's, it's over-determined that way. It's just, it's got yeah. too many. It's got so many versions of the story. I thought that this story also, you know, it was, I don't know if it was intentional, probably not, probably because of the source material they were working with and also the standard way that Hollywood mm -hmm. movies work. But it had all of that too. So you could do a very easy Campbell story of it. You could do the ranking analysis of the mm -hmm. birth of the hero, mm -hmm. all of that stuff, and the Jungian elements. I don't know if they actually formed any kind of cohesive whole. No, and that's, again, one of the sort of mishmash problems mm -hmm. that I had. Just thinking about the way that you kind of, even aside from the theoretical, mm -hmm. how you paint the picture of a hero. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one way is a hero coming from a sort of simple background, yeah, not expect, humble, birth, humble, yeah. humble background and rising to be. And that's sort of what Excalibur does, right? He's mm -hmm. he, he comes across as this kind of slightly buffoonish right. um you know the country bumpkin who suddenly country... turns out to be the son of the king what yeah. am i going to do how am i going yeah. to live up to this quest whereas the 2004 king arthur painted him as this sort of aristocratic mm -hmm. hero mm -hmm. this had the potential of of doing that kind of dissolute yeah I, the thing was it was never really dissolute no this is the thing is he had he was too honorable in a sense, right? He was a diamond in the rough from the very beginning. From the beginning. Yeah. And you kind of wanted him, you wanted to have some sort of character trajectory of him going from being a bit of a rogue. Mm. To noble? To noble. Yeah. That might have made more sense. I mean, I think that, I think this is, you're right that there are several models and I think one of the models, it, there is also the model of the diamond in the rough. Yeah, I suppose. The, I mean, that's sort of the not the entirety of it, but that's sort of the E.B. White sword in the stone, for instance. Right. I mean, there's a little country bumpkin there, too. But the other thing is, from the very beginning, he's sort of marked as too good to be true. He's, right. you know, he's the sweet one. He's the noble one. He's the defender of the weak mm -hmm. from the beginning, even though he's everybody else laughs at him and calls him a fool or whatever. And then he's proven to be the great. Now, that's got other elements of the humble one elevated as right. well. But I think I think that you could take the approach of saying, what is a leader and what is a hero? A hero shines under any circumstances, right? You put him in a brothel, well, he becomes a defender of the of the horse, right? right? And you put him in the mean streets, well, he becomes the leader of the gang who enforces what he sees as rough justice. Mm -hmm. And he saves up to make things better for other people. You put him in front of an army, he becomes King Arthur. And I don't think that's an impo like I don't think that's necessarily a bad way of doing it. That's a story where you're saying what is the essence of a hero and how does it shine in every different circumstance? Mm -hmm. And what is it about that hero that that you find that you can see that people identify even when there's nothing about the person that should show that he's anything special and you see it anyway. I think that's an okay storyline. But the thing is, it then it, it felt that even that never really paid off. And this is partly to do with the source material. The problem with that is the thing that marks King Arthur as King Arthur is that he can pull the sword out of the stone. Yeah. And there's no virtue in that, right? There's no character. It's not because he's a good man or 
a great leader or because everyone believes in him. It's this accident of birth mm -hmm. and this magical thing. And so if you're going to have it all about what is it, what's the innate quality that makes a man a, a hero, then you can't also have this magical talisman. Yeah. In the ancient world, that was how it worked, right? Like that's, there is no such thing as inner goodness, really. You know, you are who you are and the, the magical talismans just point out and prove it to everybody else. But if you're making the leadership about some sort of inner moral yeah. quality in, in a more modern way, in the way that we as modern readers and audiences think about heroism and leadership, then having it only really discovered and all the, the people, the masses that riot, they never get to see that he's a good person. No. They're only following him because, well, Vortigern is obviously a tyrant, so yeah. they want somebody else. And, and because of the prophecy. And because he has the sword. Mm -hmm. So that's, I think, to me, like, I don't think it was necessarily an impossible story to tell that he was always this mm -hmm. sort of diamond in the rough. But then if that's what you're going to do, then the thing that makes him king has to be people's trust in him and their, and, and of course his inner circle does. That story is developed within the inner circle to some extent. Mm -hmm. You know, the people who kidnap him, the resistance, yep. grow to love him and trust him. But the people at large, you know, at the end, when we have the final triumphant crowning, why do they care about him? Because he has the sword. He like, has the sword. It, and then Uther had the sword. Vortigern could have had the sword. It, we're told that if Arthur were killed, Vortigern would have been able to have the sword. Mm -hmm. So it's not a moral quality. So I found that, like, that was where the disconnect was. And he didn't have an opportunity to face a difficult moral choice. Yeah. Right? Yeah. He didn't um, have an opportunity to show that he really was somebody who would make the moral decision. And that's one of the interesting things about the, the Arthur story is that Arthur, in his... And this is possibly part of the fact that this only tells this very early part of the story. But yeah. Arthur faces these difficult moral decisions mm -hmm. and has to confront putting the good of his kingdom mm -hmm. ahead of his own. And he fails at some of them. And he fails at some of them. Yeah. And so those interesting kind of moral mm -hmm. uh, decisions were sort of left out of this story. Now, to be fair, those aren't in the early part they of the story. They aren't in the early story. part the of the story. The story of yeah. Arthur up to his coronation does not involve Arthur making any difficult decisions. No. He he is, in fact, he makes almost no decisions yeah. at all in the version that has the Sword and the Stone. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the earliest versions don't have the Sword and the Stone, right. but the, the ones that do have a Sword and the Stone, he doesn't make any decisions yeah. before the Sword and the Stone because he doesn't know who he is. Yeah. And then suddenly he's the king. And so this may, may be in part because of the the decisions they made in terms of mm -hmm. the part of the story that they wished mm -hmm. to tell. But then at the same time, that version of the story just has him go from, who am I? What What's going on? Oh my God, I'm suddenly king. And that's what, you know, the the older versions. Whereas this one makes it a, a, a conscious struggle to be, he pulls the sword from the stone and then there's this whole big period of conscious struggle to become king. Yeah, he doesn't want to be king and... And well, and then he has to fight for it. Yes. And I mean, there is a little bit of him having to fight for it in some of the versions, yes. the historical versions of having to fight for it once he pulls the sword mm -hmm. from the stone. But, you know, it, they're basically just straight military. Mm -hmm. He just has to prove that he's really good at fighting. There are all the figures like the final fight with Vortigern. If you're looking, because I've just taught a class on myth, I'm thinking mm -hmm. in those sort of terms. And you look at it from this, say, Jungian or the Campbell, which is a very Jungian mm -hmm. approach. You know, obviously there's the refusal of the, there's the call to adventure. Yeah. And then there's the refusal, refusal. of the call. He yeah. says, no, I don't want to be this. I don't want it. He tries to throw the sword away. It's kind of extended over several yeah. movements, but basically, and then he finally accepts it. And then he has the help from the goddess, who is the magical mm -hmm. female figure. He has the old wise man who helps him, mm -hmm. uh, in particular, the leader of the Kung Fu Academy. Not totally sure. Oh, yeah. Kung Fu uh, George, as they yeah. call him. You know, he's an old wise man who, who's, who trains him in his yeah. youth. And he has a couple of other male wisdom figures. Bedivere, I guess, also. Yeah, kind to of some extent. That. Yeah. And then what we have in the end is the atonement with the father. Yes. And it's made very, very literal. First of all, he's fighting the great monster who is his uncle. Right. So that's very straightforward. And then he even has to, in order to finally find the inner fortitude to do what he has to do, he has to, he literally has a conversation with his dead father who yeah. passes on and says, yes, I recognize you as worthy. You have passed the test. The sword is yours. So in that sense, it does follow that line, but it just seems so predictable. Mm. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't seem to get you anywhere. So what Guy Ritchie said, and I'm going to paraphrase, but I might be getting it slightly wrong, but from his conversation, what he said was about that the movie is about a 
someone and many people learning who they really are, mm. figuring out who they really are underneath everything and not just what other people think they are, but who they really are. And I can see how he thinks that, but I've got to say, I don't think that's the movie he made, or at least mm. I don't think it succeeds at that. Mm. Because what does Arthur find out he really is? Well, he finds out he's a king, but that's an external thing. You know, when you say that, when you say somebody, it's about somebody finding out who he really is, that should be an inner journey, yeah, right? Like that should be a journey about self-discovery, about finding something in, not about learning what the difference in mm -hmm. station in life. I mean, that is a very Cam Campbell thing or mm -hmm. a very ancient heroic journey is change in your station in life. Okay, sure. But if it's a psychological journey. And that's the thing is he doesn't change. No, he really doesn't. In, in those really deep ways. Mm -hmm. I mean, he learns to be a thing. Mm -hmm. He learns a job, basically. Yeah. Um, he learns how to live up to that prophecy. Mm -hmm. But his own personal, as you say, he's a diamond in the, in the rough, rough, right? Yeah. So, so he's already he doesn't that. have to go through any kind of moral and it's transformation and, or and anything. The, and the strange thing is they give him all of the trappings of that psychological journey. You know, some really mm -hmm. explicit ones. Like when they take him to the island... And they put him in the stone circle and they say, okay, now you have to journey through the dark forest or whatever it is, the dark places. And he goes on this journey that seems to be entirely in his mind. And yet, mm -hmm. you know, and he battles all these monsters and he gets totally beaten up and everything. That's a lit almost literalization, right? Of mm -hmm. the idea that you have to go and you have to meet the shadow and the animus and you have to fight yeah. and, and, the, and the anima and you have to fight through all of these psychological turmoil. And and comes back from that. And so you've, you've done this great psychological journey where you're supposed to have a transformative moment, that moment of realization, the epiphany. And then there's another one where she gives him a hallucinogenic mm -hmm. drug, basically. But in that first one, he comes to the what he thinks the altar and he, he remembers the moment when he's abandoned, when his father dies, which he's been blocking mm -hmm. out and he's been dreaming about. I mean, so Jungian, right? He's been having these dreams, this repeated dream, but he never quite gets to it. So now he goes through it in this waking trance and he confronts it. And she says to him, you know, you have to see it. You have to decide to face it. That's all about this idea of facing your shadow, facing all of these things. And yet in the end, what does he learn when she finally forces him to take that last moment of looking? He sees that it was his uncle who killed his father. That was obvious. Everyone knew that. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I, like, I, I was waiting for some sort of other revelation, and there was no revelation. And in the end, what did that revelation do? What did it transform in him? Yeah, it was very literal. It wasn't mm -hmm. figurative there, in any way. No, there was nothing metaphorical about it. And in terms of motivation, he already knew Vortigern had harmed the king. And once he'd pulled out the sword, he'd accepted that his father was indeed the king. Mm -hmm. So he knew, Vort everybody knew that Vortigern had killed Uther. So this revelation just made him more angry at the person he'd already sworn to kill. And it didn't change. It didn't change his motivation. It didn't change his I, didn't, I just didn't understand. It, it was built up to as this mm -hmm. big moment of revelation in, in this very mythic and psychological mm -hmm. pattern that is very recognizable. And I just it wasn't paid off. And nothing changed about him. Mm -hmm. You know, all that changed is he got that extra bit of grit that got him up out of his faint and stood up and was able to use the sword better. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the sword recognized him as its owner finally and he was able to control it. But that's an external. That's not a character change. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I felt like it was all there, but never completely and I, i'm not trying to say that it needed to be massively deep or anything i mean it's, it's a silly action movie mm. of course it doesn't have to be but but even so like you know even the king arthur movie the earlier one which i think is a really quite a bad movie personally like the earlier king arthur movie i think there's lots in there i dislike intensely but nonetheless the king arthur of that movie did have a journey he started from a position, he came to a different position where he had a real change of his understanding of what nationhood meant, yeah. of what identity meant, of what belonging meant, of who he was and who he belonged to, what he thought was important and what wasn't important, and what kind of person he was, what decisions he would make. And he made a really difficult, couple of really difficult decisions, yeah. right? I don't think it's a great movie, but I think the Arthur... It's a more interesting, it's a more interesting movie in that sense. Mm -hmm. 
And, you know, this movie could have had none of that and it could have been okay, but it's because it had the trappings of this journey, like Mm -hmm. these moments of revelation where it seemed to be taking you through the psychological journey and there's nothing there. Mm -hmm. And so I, when I go back to Guy Ritchie saying that it's about a man learning who he really is, in the end, that felt really trivial, Yeah, which is unfortunate. Here's a question for you then. Mm. So it's not historical, right? It's not historicizing. It's also not entirely, anyway, high fantasy. Yeah. Why is it medieval? What is the appeal of the medieval when it's so ahistorical? You know, when you when you're going for the medieval, but without saying, okay, we're gonna tell a story that's really grounded in a particular medieval historical event. Yeah. When there's so much anachronism mm-hmm. of all sorts of different kinds, what is the freedom, or what is the plot point, or what is the what can be shown, what can be said, what can be done because of this setting that makes someone want to choose that? Do you think? And it's 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 also not the the sensibility because as we said yeah. it's a very modern sensibility so yeah. it's not showing the the sort of you know high chivalry or something mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. So why why make it a medieval movie? Why make a medieval movie? I mean, I can think of potential answers to that, but I don't think any of them apply to this film. Mm-hmm. I mean, you could be trying to draw parallels between the medieval and the modern, mm-hmm. and that's not where no, this I don't film think that's what this is doing. goes. You know, I think it's just the sort of trappings of the medieval yeah. more than anything else here. Yeah, and it's sort of sad to say that because I agree. I think there are lots of potential reasons for setting something in the medieval. And in some ways, it's it's one that I'm almost surprised Richie didn't take advantage of, mm. is that you get to have your characters say and do things that aren't acceptable now. Right. And that's certainly why sometimes people put stuff into the middle, you know, the med- medieval or the ancient world. I mean, you think of Rome or Vikings or something, right? Right. You get to show brutality. It's a very different worldview. And yeah, and things that are shocking. You know, mm-hmm. why Game of Thrones? Why is it medieval in its con- conceptualization? There's various reasons. It's not entirely medieval, but it's not because necessarily the medieval period was like that. Mm-hmm. It may or may not have been, but because you set it in a different period, you get a license to do these things. Right. But Richie doesn't really, I think, take advantage of that. There's fighting and stuff, but of course, modern action movies can have lots of deaths and yeah. and in many ways he uses kind of modern style weapons mm-hmm. <laughs> in some ways mm-hmm. in, in the sort of powers of the sword and things and yet he doesn't have his hero for instance do things that we would find objectionable were they modern mm-hmm. he's in fact very modern very in modern his in sensibilities yeah and... he, he doesn't let people get away with medieval things yeah and even the villain to be honest He's villainous in sort of grand ways, but he doesn't like sexually brutalize the women in his life. He kills them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not good, obviously. But like that's again, you could have murders in a modern setting mm-hmm. for your villain. He doesn't do things. I mean, I mean, I'm thinking of Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, or something, and the Alan Rickman right. villain. Right. I mean, obviously that's a very silly example, but they get to have him be witchy and yeah. and just evil in a delightful evil way that wouldn't play terribly it just wouldn't make mm-hmm. any sense in a modern setting so there's something mm-hmm. you know there's something he gets to be that you couldn't do in a modern mm-hmm. and i sort of feel the only thing there is the is the magic yeah which is why in a way i wish they'd sort of left the the magic out mm-hmm. and focus more on the sort of politics of the yeah. situation that yeah. could have been an, an interesting nation building and mm-hmm. what what do you have to do to consolidate power mm-hmm. and uh, yeah. the politics of the medieval world that could have been an interesting take yeah. on it yeah and instead you have this sort of car- not, almost cartoony villain because mm-hmm. he's so over the top evil and he's got all these powers, powers yeah. and then you have a scrappy band of resistance fighters who seem much more motivated sort of by political motivations mm-hmm, almost. Mm-hmm. And, and so it's like, are they even fighting the same person? Yeah. And then you have those Vikings. What did you feel about the Vikings? I suppose they called them Vikings be, just be, for the recognition of the name value, but they yeah. could have called them Saxons. That would have made sense, sense some, <laughs> yeah, some logical know. sense. but uh, Would have made lots of sense if it given it's Vortigern. Yes. If Vortigern were Inviting making, Saxons in making and, deals with the Saxons, yeah. which then Arthur overturns. Yeah. I mean, it wouldn't be exactly historical, but it would, it would have a flavor of that historical yeah. period, yeah. yeah. And then also there's this idea that they wanted thousands of boys for their religion. Yeah. To that, like sacrifice or know. be slaves or clear. something? Uh, slaves, I think, but yeah. I don't know. Which just seemed like an unnecessary slander on the entire Scandinavian people. Yeah. <laughs> but I guess it was just thrown in there so that there could be some truly dastardly thing mm-hmm. that Arthur had to disavow. But then it it's dropped. Other. Yeah. 
they say, okay, we'll just be friends then. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, it's okay that you wanted 10,000 boys to do something horrible too, but since I'm not going to give them to you, we can just be friends. And they were also the villains of the piece because they beat up the woman at the beginning, right? Yeah. They beat up the yeah. prostitute. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm left feeling like the only reason it's set in the Arthurian period is, is so you can call it King Arthur. Well, and I think, you know, even setting it in the Arthurian world is just an excuse for the name, yeah. right? Like, they didn't use any previous Arthur material, okay? Well, they did. I mean, they, they had the they had Sword of the, the Storm. Stone. They had the Lady of the Lake. Yeah. So, okay, let's follow that up for just a moment. The obvious absences. Guinevere, we've already talked about. She comes later. Mm -hmm. That's okay. The story doesn't yeah. need Guinevere. Merlin. Merlin is the obvious. Yeah. So Lancelot's the other one, but he also comes later. So that's fine. Like all of those stories mm -hmm. you would expect later. Merlin, though, is weird because he's so integral to mm -hmm. most of the versions of his rise to power. Now, unless you think and of... he's mentioned... Unless you think of the mage character as being the sort of Merlin. But she, but you, you know he's mentioned, right? Merlin is yeah. mentioned right at the beginning. Yeah. When she first turns up to find the guy mm -hmm. who ends up being the resistance fighter. Bede, that's Bedivere, right? Bedivere, when she yeah. comes to him. He says, you're from Merlin. Yeah. You're going to guide him to me. And we think, or I thought the him was Merlin. Mm-hmm. But it was Arthur. And then Merlin never comes again. We hear about mm -hmm, him, that mm -hmm. he forged Excalibur and stuff like that, but he never he's appears. Mentioned, but, yeah. He's mentioned, but yeah. He's mentioned and I guess dead or it, it's not, it's not clear. We're never made clear. And I just thought that was, mm -hmm. I mean, I was happy enough that we had a different woman, mage, instead mm -hmm. of Merlin. But it was another, it was sort of like Mordred in the sense that by introducing him at all, it became a bit Chekhov's gun, yeah. you know, like... Mm -hmm. If you've mentioned Merlin as the sort of force behind the scenes, never having yeah. him come forward or in any other way pay off yeah. is weird. I would have expected him to turn up at the end or something, right? Mm -hmm. No, he just gets mentioned. G you know, given how important mm -hmm. he is to the normal story, if they'd never mentioned him, I would have thought, okay, leave, leaving up Merlin. But, mm -hmm. but I mean, the other thing is that, you know, not only do they, okay, they use a few elements of the Arthur story, but they mm -hmm. dump a lot of it, but that's fine. You know, you can mm -hmm. reinterpret the, the details, but they also don't really go with any of the themes of the Arthur story. And they, cr they add so much that you, at a certain point you think, well, why are they even calling it Arthur in a sense? Mm -hmm. It's not, you know, reinterpreting the they're themes add in, in, all a, those in a mage different context or something. Yeah, and... they're adding all this this extra stuff. You could have made this film without calling it King Arthur and mm -hmm. it probably wouldn't have changed very much. No, but of course what it would have changed is whether you could sell it as King Arthur. Yeah. And I'm don't I'm not saying that that's all that Guy Ritchie was thinking. I don't think it is. I'm sure he came to it first thinking, I'm going to do King, King Arthur. Arthur yeah. And then he worked it through yeah. into what he wanted it and to I be. And that's fair. His thought process may have been, okay, let's take the Arthur story and strip it down to what mm -hmm. what he saw as the, mm -hmm. the you know basic element and then go from, build it up from there. Yeah, and, and parts of the movie I felt were what I would expect him to find in it, which mm -hmm. is it's a movie about a man and his relationship with other men yeah, and the ways that they form friendships, bonds, trust between one another because there's lots in the movie of exploring and and showing the sort of male camaraderie of fighting together the loyalty inspired by uh -huh. trust in one another the father-son relationship right so we right. have the Which doubling of the father-son yeah. we have the good father and son and uh -huh. then we have the uh, not that Uther's a bad father and son, but the absent father. Yeah, yeah. And then the bad father, Vortigern, with his daughter, who yeah. he kills. And so we have, you know, the, the father who wants to sacrifice for his son and the son who wants to sacrifice for his father and all of that stuff. And lots of good male themes. Mm -hmm. But all of that is in the Arthur half, not the Vortigern half, or mm -hmm. paid off a bit in the Vortigern half, but all the magical stuff that that's not it's not in the magical stuff so it i feel like there was the part that i would expect guy ritchie to find mm -hmm. and i'm not saying that would be like some it would be a fairly predictable story in a sense mm -hmm. but that wouldn't that be okay i would have enjoyed watching it i mm -hmm. think more than watching that grafted onto this other story mm -hmm. about giant elephant things and flaming men mm -hmm. and snakes <laughs> yeah which was like, why the snakes? Yeah, it was not motivated or explained at all. It just... Well, she has power over animals. That yeah, was yeah, clear I all the way through. I suppose that's the motivation, but... But, and at the end, in the very end, it was sort of like, we have to do this cunning trickery stuff to, to do all this various stuff. And then in the end, all it took was she just sent a snake. And, like, nothing that Arthur did 
was required for the. I mean, mm. he had to face down Vortigern at the end, but she could have sent in that eagle with the snake at any point, surely, yeah, yeah. and killed various people and knocked down the tower. You mm-hmm. know, like it, it, <laughs> there's some logical problems with it. I felt like there was a lot of um, conflation of the heroic type of Robin Hood yes. and the heroic type of Arthur. Now, that yeah. is fair in a sense. Mm-hmm. There's definite connections between the Robin Hood story mm-hmm. and the mm-hmm. Arthur story. But that it felt like at times, like I had to remind myself it was Arthur, not Robin Hood. Yeah, because you had that kind of ragtag hiding in the forest in the, and a yeah. bunch of men hiding in the forest. And yeah, there were definite influences of the, of mm-hmm. the, the Robin, the Robin Hood, Hood stories. stories. Yeah. yeah. And that, yeah, the sort of guerrilla warfare parts mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And interestingly, you said it didn't do the politics. And one thing that you mentioned when we were trying to figure out what to drink, and mm-hmm. I suggested something Celtic. And your reaction was, there is nothing, nothing Celtic, Celtic about that no. movie. And and he refers to himself as, you know, when at the end he says, when you you speak to me now, you're speaking to England. Yes. Right? And so they refer to themselves as English. Yeah. This ultimate Celtic story has been... But then that happened. That happened, I mean... Early on, right? Layman, the first mm-hmm. English version of the... I was just listening to mm-hmm. Kevin Strauss' History of the English Language about King Arthur. And he makes that point that yeah. Layman, the first English version of uh, the King Arthur story, explicitly along the way, or not explicitly, but keeps conflating Britain, Britain and, and England. England. Yeah. And they become interchangeable in that text. Yeah. And Arthur, in fact, by the end of it, is going to come back when England is threatened. Yeah. The once and future king. Mm-hmm. And that, that's a big transformative element. That's mm-hmm. the 12th century, I think. Yes. Yeah, the 12th century. So. Uh, so it's you know it's obviously not Richie who does this for the first time, but it's interesting nonetheless to point out that mm-hmm. it's very English. And, and I, think... I thought that was one of the interesting things about the 2004 King Arthur mm-hmm. um, is that it very much confronts the idea of ethnicity yes. and identity. That is and... the most interesting thing about yeah. that movie. It does it in an odd way, given it's supposedly historical and it's so ina- it has so many historical problems yeah. <laughs> um, in terms of the peoples mm-hmm. and the places that it deals with. But nonetheless, this being a historical, I didn't expect it to have necessarily a strong grounding in the exact ethnicities and stuff. But still, the fact that it doesn't really play with that mm-hmm. kind of gestures towards it a couple of times with the Vikings, with some of those things, but it never it, no. it never fully develops them. I think that was part of what made it feel like Robin Hood too, though. Yeah. To how English it was. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Because that's Robin Hood is Saxon, like Anglo-Saxon. It's English versus yeah. French. Yeah. So it's very English. So I think maybe that's part of the, the thing that made that feel similar. Or I suppose the other, uh, along those lines, the sort of confused gestures towards medieval elements is they refer to the barons. Oh, yes, that they're going to have to talk to the barons and convince them. And this idea that power somehow comes from the barons is a very post-conquest. Post-Norman conquest. Post-Norman conquest and is very much in, you know, many of the Arthur stories Mm -hmm. because that's, you know. Because that's the 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 reality of the 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 tellers of the stories. And so they make this little gesture towards the barons, but then it never gets picked up on. Yeah. And the barons in that are what, like posh Englishmen? Yeah. The way they're... big deal made about their education or something and yes that they were all educated and they're going to say i king Ar- i arthur was not and yes. but and the way they're portrayed in the, now it's a one of these sort of depictions of a thing that never actually happens yeah. but the way they're depicted is as like i don't know po- posh oxbridge kind of yeah. aristocrats which is fine it doesn't it would make sense of if they were like norman norman barons yeah. because that's who the barons were in english history is but of course you can't have norman the normans would be completely out of place, place in yeah. this mm-hmm. version because this it was another strange note mm-hmm. that piece but you know made a funny joke i guess <laughs> oh yeah and it was a good scene and, and it was a all of the scenes where charlie hunnam got to be sort of all right i'm gonna tell you how it's gonna be mm-hmm. They were good. Mm-hmm. They were, you know, they mm-hmm. were endearing and they were interesting and they were engaging mm-hmm. and they were fun. But that in the end seemed to be all there was to it. Yeah. All right. I think that's enough said about the movie. In the end, there are a lot of King Arthur movies and maybe we'll talk about the rest, some others another time because we have both taught mm-hmm. King Arthur movies and we have other thoughts about and we've considered doing an, an episode that's more about the Arthurian romances mm-hmm. in general. So maybe we could talk about, you know, the evolution of the Arthur story right. in more detail from its earliest textual forms to some of the 20th century adaptations another time. But I think in that trajectory, 
I don't think this movie is going to be very influential. No, I think it's going to kind of disappear. Whatever it is as a movie, I may not be massively important as a movie either, but in particular as an Arthur story. Yeah. Because it just doesn't really engage with the Arthurian elements very strongly, Mm -hmm. I don't think. No, and I, you know, I don't think there has, since Excalibur, I don't think there's been a movie that has resonated with the Arthurian story. Yeah, I might disagree with that, but we can come back to that discussion. I think the most interesting attempt at that was the 2004, yeah. because it tried to do something very different. Yeah, as I said, we can we can but revisit we can, that topic, yeah. but I do, th- I do think this one doesn't really take you very far. No. Because it feels like the Arthurian elements are tacked on rather mm-hmm. than fundamental. Yeah. And so it doesn't progress the story of Arthur. I mean, the story of Arthur can be reinterpreted in so many ways to be applicable to the many issues of our society, grand or small. It doesn't have to be big, right. big picture stuff. Right, right. It can be pretty trivial or it can be very internal or psychological or about the hero quest or whatever. And I just don't feel like this movie really did any of those things, Mm -hmm. unfortunately. I would be very interested to know if anyone who's listening has seen the movie, what you think. Do you disagree? Do you think it has more resonance with the Arthurian story? Because frankly, I'd like to know, like I'd like to find more. I'm Mm -hmm. I'm sort of, I'm disappointed that it doesn't Mm -hmm. have as much to do with Arthur as I thought it might. So I'd like to hear from you. And, you know, give us your thoughts about the movie in general and if you have seen it and what place it does have in that kind of long line Mm -hmm. of Arthurian adaptations for you. And if you want to bring up any other Arthurian Mm -hmm. uh, films or books or TV shows, because I think that's where Arthur has been more actually That's actually what I was partly thinking about when you said I don't think anything else has resonated. I think there's been some TV shows. TV shows, shows that yes. Have, yeah. have Not done films, more. I don't think, but was it Merlin? Merlin, yeah. I think has, um, I haven't seen very much of it, but I think it's done more interesting things with with the Arthurian story than any, any other film that I've seen mm-hmm. recently. Mm-hmm. So yeah, let us know if there's something that interests you in the Arthurian oeuvre. <laughs> yeah. Oeuvre? Louvre? No. <laughs> In the Arthurian body of work, you know, of, of adaptations and interpretations. If you've got a favorite that we haven't mentioned, there's lots and lots of them out there. Let us know. And for now, I've already finished my bastardized King Arthur. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sort of going slow on mine, but... Uh, you don't like it, do you? No, it's all right. It's not very interesting, <laughs> but, you know, it's all right. Kind of like the film. So with that, <laughs> that's our last thought on the movie. <laughs> We'll be back soon with a probably quite different topic. (laughs) Good night. Bye-bye. For more information on this podcast, check out the website www.alliterative.net, where you can find links to the videos, blog posts, sources, and credits. We've also got all the ways you can follow us. Twitter, Facebook, Tumblr, G+, a mailing list, and Instagram. And please check out our Patreon, where you can pledge to support this show and our video project. You can go directly to the videos at youtube.com slash alliterative. Our email is on the website, but the easiest way to get in touch with us is on Twitter. I'm at Avensarah, A-V-E-N-S-A-R-A-H. And I'm at alliterative. To keep up with the podcast, subscribe on iTunes or to the feed on the website. And please review it on iTunes if you can and if you've enjoyed it. It helps us a lot. We'll be back soon with more musings about the connections around us. Thanks for listening. Bye.